Welcome back to the Nassman Hockey Podcast, brought to you by the Hockey Podcast Network and the Hockey Writers. Yes, you heard that right. We are part of a new network now, along with the Hockey Writers. We are now part of the Hockey Podcast Network. Really excited to get going. Really cool network. You can see we got a new display going on here, some cool new things coming. So really excited to get going. What's up, John? I'm here with John, as always, by the way. Not not a whole lot. Excited to get to it. Um, the Hockey Podcast Network's been awesome so far. A lot of great tools. Um, and if you yeah, if you're watching this on YouTube, you might be getting a nice fresh look here. Um, we're yeah. gonna get used to things. Um, we've played around with it all weekend, uh, the last two or three days. So excited to just get it going. Yeah. So let's get to around the NHL. Brought to you by DraftKings. Two of the sport's most respected fighters step back into the octagon this weekend to compete for the welterweight title. DraftKings, the official daily fantasy partner of UFC, is giving you a shot at huge cash prizes. For this weekend's fight, DraftKings is offering new players a shot at millions of dollars in total prizes. If you haven't tried it yet, fantasy MMA is easy to play. Just pick six fighters, stay under the salary cap, and pile up points for advances, takedowns, and more. There's no better way to put your MMA knowledge to the test than to compete for a shot at millions of dollars in total prizes. Plus, don't forget about basketball and hockey, where DraftKings has even more money up for grabs this weekend. DraftKings is safe, secure, and reliable, so you can deposit and withdraw your funds at your convenience. Download the DraftKings app now and use promo code THPN to get a shot at millions of dollars in total prizes throughout the week. That's promo code THPN to get a shot at millions of dollars in total prizes only at DraftKings. Minimum $5 deposit eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com for details. I nailed that. I that nailed good. that. Our first I, one. I feel phenomenal. That, that's feel good. Phenomenal. Let's, let, let's ride the high. Get it. Let's get into oh, the yeah. news. Let's get to around the NHL. Let's talk about Jim Rutherford, who steps down in Pittsburgh. That was a surprise to me. I think it was a surprise to everybody. Yeah, and it's a, it's an interesting time um, in their in their history in Absolutely. in the Penguins' history and and their future rather. Yeah, because uh, it, it, it's like, where are they right now? We don't really know because they still have Sidney Crosby and Evgeny Malkin. Malkin's not too hot right now. Pittsburgh's not too hot as a total, you know, as a total unit. So it's like, where are they right now? And, and now Jim Rutherford, who has done a real good job there is out. Yeah, I mean they they kind of sold the the farm f- to win now around Sidney Crosby, right. Malkin, Latang, uh Flurry for for the time that he was there. Um I mean this is really the kind of the second, you know, those second cups were the second and third cup rather were different teams really than the first one. Sure. Different goaltending, some, you know, some different pieces. Billy Garen's there, I believe for that first one. Um traded to the Penguins from the Islanders, if I'm not mistaken, um, at the trade deadline, yeah. and so I think it's a different team altogether uh, at that that second one. Now, I mean, they do have the Gensels and and some of these young kids, um, but they I think they have the 31st ranked prospect pool. Yeah, you know, and that's great. because Rutherford was building around these teams, and and they were being um, contenders every single right. season. So now, I mean, I've I've heard this a number of times on a on a different podcast from silly to serious, and they all said the next GM is going to be overlooking the Penguins post Crosby, or at least the decline of Crosby and Malkin. That's true, and, and that's not. I mean, these are coveted positions, right? There's 32 of these jobs, so somebody wants it. Um, Chris Drury, you know, wanted to stay in New York. The Rangers invested in him. I think that was a really cool move, uh, you know, on both sides that they were invested in that team, um, you know, and, and they they pick Hextall and they bring in Brian Brian Burke, yeah, um, they did. Who was on? Who was previously, at, you know, just recently on Sportsnet, um, and yeah, I mean, I think if they have a really really tough job to try to pick the direction of where they're going. Yeah, so uh, Hextall is in as the GM. Burke is in as the president of hockey operations. So it's going to be really interesting to see how that that team is run. Burke, to me, is not too different. And and I'm not talking success. I'm talking in style. Not too different to Lamorello. So it's going to be interesting to see the culture change go on in Pittsburgh, if there's going to be any. I I don't know if, you know, he came in and – and I mean, he's the president of of hockey operations, so I, I would imagine that he's the guy who everybody answers to 
uh, besides the owners. So yeah, Hex, be- Hextall kind of um, answers to him, right. to Burke. Right. And when, when I've heard Burke in interviews, he was on the Steve Dangle podcast not very long ago. And he you know, was talking about when he's interviewed for teams and things like yeah. that as a GM. And he always mentions, I there's two hands on the wheel and they're both mine. So and that was I think Chicklets. it's really interesting. Yeah, that was with Chicklets. He's and, and he, it's and true. he said that. I bet he said it because I've listened to Chicklets. Yeah. And geez, but I think um, I, I think he, that's just what he says. Yeah, that's probably just his line. And you know, the fact that he says it verbatim every single time sounds like that's probably what was said in the interview. Yeah. Um. So it'll be interesting to see. You know, those are two big personalities. Um. Yeah. They obviously agreed to work together. I wonder if Burke's mentality. You know, maybe it's a lot like Lamorello. You know, it's it's hard. You know, it has the game passed Lamarola by, you know, it, it, certain signings and different things right. sticking to his guns. Burke may be in the same position. Um, you know, there were jokes out there like you tr- trading, you know, Konechny for some toughness and Lucic or something like that. Yeah. Um, you know, to bring bring to uh, to Pittsburgh. And um, you wonder what these moves are going to be like. I don't suspect it'll be something as silly as that, though you never know. Um, but yeah, their direction it remains to be seen. I've seen I saw some quotes today from Burke. You know, they, they they're not going to be public about it yet. They have to decide yeah. what they want to do. They haven't already. Um, you know, but it was discussed in in the interview. And yeah, I think. Well, I, I'll ask you. What do you think? Do, you know, you have the pieces that they have. Do you know their goaltending hasn't been super great so far this year? But it's still yeah. good. They've won a Stanley Cup or at least, you know multiple cups, and not that you know. I guess 16, 17 is getting more in the rear view mirror every day. But while you have Malkin and Crosby, albeit on the other side, you know, they're on the decline, even if they're still the, some of the best players in the game. What do you do here? How, what's your play? Yeah. So, and it, it's, it's super interesting too, now that Burke is involved, right? Because like you said before, he, he's mentioned, I have two hands on the wheel. So I, I control this destiny. Now, that being said, if I was the GM of the Penguins and I just got hired in in the state that they're in right now, I would have to have a sit down with my captain of the team, who is Sidney Crosby. My, if you know, if that team has another superstar like to do with Malkin, I'm going to bring Malkin in, and, and likely I'm going to bring Latang in too, just because they've been there so long. Well, as Latang well as is the GM. Latang's interesting because he's continues to be in rumors to be traded. So, and that's and, and part that's of why the, they think Rutherford was on the way yeah. out. There was this agreement. Yeah, it, was, this, it that, wasn't it just was, personal. So he is an interesting guy, but continue. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, you're right, though. There is that heavy rumor that that um, Rutherford was getting ready to trade him, and they they hexed it. They said no. Um, and I think that was the straw that broke the camel's back for him. I'm assuming that might have happened a couple of times by ownership. Who knows? But maybe the reason why there is new owners uh, – I'm sorry, new, new uh, management is because the owner said – you know, we're we're not moving Latang. So now you got to bring Latang into the room. The, these guys have been there for so long, and you have to have that conversation. What's the future? What does it look like? Let's be realistic. Can we win right now? Who who's the supporting cast for you three guys? You know, they bring in Kasperi Kapanen. Uh, they have Jake Gensel. He was a ghost against the Islanders. Kapanen. Right, that's I what I'm see. saying. And he's good. I I kind of. Um... I kind of wish the Islanders had got their hands on him. That would have been a really good yeah, he, part he's, of the, the he's forward a good group. Speedy little winger, um, a middle six guy, but you know, there's nothing wrong with that. I, I'm sure he could score a bunch of goals next to Sidney Crosby. I could do that if you stuck me out there with a pair of skates. But yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, you know, that's that's the thing. You have to have the conversation. You know, and you have to all be on the same page and and be like, listen. You know, we, we won our cups. We're a little past our prime now, or, or not a little. We're we're kind of past our prime now. You know, we're not we're not a powerhouse in in this uh, East Division anymore. It's it's not. I mean, a that, that came crashing down against the Islanders in that first right. round. It right. was, and that was, and that team was, I think it was pretty healthy at that point. And oh yeah, absolutely. It was just you know, it was structure over pure talent. Yeah, and it you know, very it was very obvious how that worked out right so they have to be realistic with themselves and and really say you know are are we going to get ready to rebuild and do you want to be a part of that rebuild uh and 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 that that would be said to you know crosby malik and letang because i'd imagine they want to be lifetime penguins i imagine they want to retire with penguin jerseys on you know they've never been anywhere else they've won i don't know about letang i mean maybe maybe definitely crosby i honestly don't know about the other two i've not 
I, I wouldn't doubt it, you know, if Malkin's going to get paid, but right. um, I think they all want to win. Um, you know, sure. not that Crosby doesn't, but I think he's he's sticking with the Penguins. I think it's important right. to him that he's on one team in his career. I agree. I agree. And and like you said, you know, who knows about the other two, but I, I, I could see that conversation happening. Uh, even further, I could see that conversation happening where Burke says, this is the direction. You're either in or you're out. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think it, because of Crosby's relationship with one of the owners, which is Mario Lemieux, um, right. it's it's going to be tough. You know, I, I, I'm interested to if it ever comes out that the story of you know how this kind of all came together, um, because Burke is a really big personality, as I said, you know, as as is um, Ron Hextall. But the you know, Lemieux, I think, is close to. Yeah. You know ma- the decision making process he's not far away he's not yeah. just he's not in, you know hanging out in some um some beach house somewhere away from the rink I, I, you know i think he's very active in all this stuff so you know they had to have had some kind of agreement or uh you know with with the direction before they accepted and, and signed on the dotted line so yeah i'm in, i'm interested to see how it goes i don't think it's going to be some fire sale this year is not a good marker i think any team including the Islanders can convince themselves, eh, whatever, this was a joke season. Right. I, I think it not like last season where the Islanders came in and it was like, all right, you're in the playoffs. You have an opportunity right. here, go on a run. I think, um, you know, losing last season, if you were, you know, lost, especially if you lost in the first round or earlier, uh, didn't even make, really make the playoffs. Right. Y- you weren't really happy about that. You saw that there was a huge opportunity there wasted. There is one here as well, but you could very easily convince yourself, okay, that's it. Yeah, maybe in the play- last year's playoffs too. But either way, I-, I think you can very easily just say, "Okay, don't worry about it. We'll retool in the summer, expansion draft, some more opportunities yeah. here, um, guys off the books, this and that." Um, so, regardless, you know, maybe that's the way the Penguins are looking at it. We we can keep this roster and maybe do some slight retooling at the deadline if we're close. Right. Um, the thing is, they don't like I said, they don't have a ton of assets, uh, and they haven't for a long time, whether that's prospects or picks. So. Yeah, I don't know what the future of this team looks like at the trade deadline of this season. Forget about after that, and especially with the expansion draft. You know, they're going to yeah. have to ha- if there is anybody coveted, can they keep them safe? So yeah, it'll it'll yeah. be tough for them. They have they have quite the job. Um, and like I like I said earlier, um, they're going to see the you know the the back half of these guys' careers one way or another, and that's a tough job. Definitely. It's definitely a tough job. And there's going to be some, you know, realignment of the powerhouses in the East Division now because it's, in my mind, it's pretty likely that this team is going to head for, you know, maybe not a rebuild, but a retool. And it's going to take a transition uh, for them. You know, they might have a a year or two where it's a a down year. So we'll see what happens. But uh, speaking of the East Division, there have been uh, a couple of new Horizon COVID issues. Uh, out in Buffalo, New Jersey, and and not in the East, but uh, out out west in Minnesota, um, there's new protocols in place. Um, you know, they they got rid of the glass behind uh, the the bench, which actually caused a, a controversial penalty call in the Islander game last night. Uh, we'll talk about that a little later. Um, but there's no glass because it's supposed to you know improve ventilation. Guys can't get to the rink before a certain time now, which yeah, a can, lot of can, players express. Has- yeah, it can, and that can't be earlier than an hour forty-five. Yeah, you know, a lot unless of, they lot have an injury like some things. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's just more of a routine thing. You know, I think of that Jack Eichel article. I believe it was with the Athletic, where he goes in, and he has an apple at two thirteen, and um, he throws the apple core out at two seventeen, and it's like this whole thing. Right. I um, mean, and he's there for hours, and he goes through his whole process. Um, I mean, as hockey players, we all had that. I mean, not to that degree. Yeah. Um, you know, I put on my left shin guard first and worked my way. You know, like everyone kind of has that, whether you think <laughs> about it or not. Right. Um, but I wonder how that's gonna to kind of play into that. Yeah. Um, you know, I yeah, I think the ventilation was obviously at, at the core of that. Um behind the benches, they're I believe they're trying to get some kind of air filtration system behind the benches too to get things moving and and collect some yeah. of the, well, the moisture or whatever. Was it Philly who completely revamped their ventilation system in the in the arena? They have a completely new system. Oh, I didn't I didn't hear that. I, yeah, I, I believe I'm it. Sure. I'm pretty sure they like they spent a lot of money on revamping the whole 
uh, ventilation system in their arena, and now it's like state of the art ventilation. So, yeah, uh, it's, good it's for Philly. For I wouldn't, you know, be surprised if you started seeing that amongst, you know, most NHL teams at this point. So, if they can afford it, it's right. It's mostly a cash thing. Although I did see something where a lot of the owners in pro sports uh, came, are coming out of this pandemic pretty, pretty uh, big in the pockets here. So uh, maybe it's Shocking. not as big of an issue. So they, they you know. <laughs> as as always, they yeah. pull one over on the players and and the and the fans by yeah. crying poor. But I guess a different discussion for a different episode. Yeah, um, yeah. So like a, a lot of these issues, Buffalo, New Jersey. I think both teams, or at least New Jersey, is getting pushed back at least a little more. One of the teams, um, Minnesota, is in a really tough way. Um, yeah, I, I think like half or or three quarters of their roster are either on the COVID protocol list or out because of COVID right now. Um, as of yesterday, um, which may have been updated by now is nine players and one wild staff member has tested positive. That was according to, to Bill Guerin. And he was, he said that, um, COVID-19 is creeping through the team one by one and he fully expects more positives to pop up again. That was yesterday. Um, the, the Mike, Michael Russo, uh, reported that yesterday. And that's, that's a little scary. And there's symptomatic players as well. Uh, there's some, you know, aches and pains and different things. Um, which is not good. And um, I think the hard part about this, and we may have touched on this in a different episode, but I think it's the recovery that re- is really scary, you know, right. stopping the spread and, and all of that. And of course you don't want anyone that gets sick, but you want them to recover and fully recover. You don't want right. anything to happen where they have reduced lung capacity. And this is just for their regular life. Hockey doesn't mean, mean a whole lot when you're sick with a really terrible virus, your family, the people that are around you and support you, it, it you know, really, your mental health deteriorates. I imagine you're, you got to isolate, sure. you know, you can't be around the team. You're, you're not doing anything. It that must be really difficult. And then, then you got to get back and then it's gotta yeah. be more tests and you're out of the loop. So you gotta, you know, get your legs back under you, get your timing back. You had a short camp to begin with. Right. Um, well, the wild had to send home Marco Rossi because he was having a hard time recovering from the, the sickness himself. And he's like a right. top prospect. He just got drafted. I think it was, uh, in the top ten, and he they're really excited about him. I think he was supposed to, you know, break onto the the roster, but they had to send him home. And then this is just just a rumor. I'm not confirming anything, but um, you know, people are talking about Mika Zibanejad. He's he's having a, a bad year. Uh, he doesn't look like himself, supposedly to some people out on the ice, and they're wondering if it's because he's still trying to recover from, you know, COVID related symptoms. So. I, I don't know. That's just a rumor. That's what people are saying, but it's not necessarily a you know something that's false because it is something that people have dealt with in the past. Yeah, I yeah I wonder. And again, we've said this a number of episodes. At what point does the short training camp and the circumstances like stop being a uh, an excuse? Like I don't at a know certain if point it does in this season, I this mean, might be a full season of it's it's sort yeah. of post COVID year. Yeah, I mean, I guess I guess that's right because especially now with games being postponed, you right. have you, you have teams, you know, you're playing almost every other day or you know eight times in 14 days, and then you have a week off. Yeah. So the Islanders, you know, kind of playing heavy schedule. They're kind of geared up for it. They're on a road trip. They're you know they're they're expecting to play. Um, this this week was supposed to be where the break was in between games with you know a couple days, and then. You know, then they have a big break and then they play Saturday and then they play Monday and then they have a few days and then they play again on Thursday. So it, I got f- that flow, you know, I, I maybe my question still um, is, is somewhat valid, but I understand what you're saying. I almost wonder if they, you know, and this is a conversation for an, another episode, but, you know, if it happens, I almost wonder if they force, you know, a week off, push, you know, the schedule back a full week, maybe 10 days make everybody go home. I imagine if it breaks out really heavily, say in a, in one particular division. Right. Yes, 100%. That division probably just gets, you know, they instead of just postponing games, they're just going to retool the whole schedule even if it's there's two or three teams that are fine. Yeah. At a certain point they probably just will shut it down and re- reschedule because awesome. at that point it's just easier that way. Yeah. Um but as we mentioned, I, I believe uh, a week or two ago, you know, it was like 50 something in the mid fifties uh, games in like a hundred days or 104 days or something like that. Yeah. So the more that this happens, um, even just one team messes it up because that's two teams out of the schedule and then you're playing each other so much that it just, the, the whole schedule just goes haywire. So yeah, it's, and it's especially interesting too, because our, uh, our buddy, Nick Alberga of uh, 
Sportsnet actually tweeted out yesterday that he had heard that there was a rumor of October 13th to be the start of the 2021-22 season. So, you know, with that floating around too, and this stuff still going on, that could change that at any moment. So I think they, I mean, they built some of this in, into their plan and I'm willing to bet that there's contingencies for contingencies. Sure. So as they don't think they expected it to be this bad this early, but they yeah. did expect it at some point and are kind of prepared to deal with it. Now, if it just keeps happening, especially with the three divisions in the United States, Canada seems to be doing an okay job. There have been no problems there. It's yeah. not even half and half or 70 30 it is zero and 100 percent between canada and the united states respectively as far as this is concerned so um the fact that there were you know whether you like it or not there were a lot of people in the stands of the super bowl and then you have two teams in florida you know playing and um when a grocery trip turns ugly for some reason and you get covid you know what i mean it, it, right. it doesn't take a whole lot so even if being on the road and, and that exacerbates it. Even if you're in a small area, like they're not going to, to Vancouver and across the country, they're staying in their time, uh, somewhat in their time zone. Yeah. Um, at least in the, within the division. Um, it, it makes it really difficult. I, right. You know, I, I keep seeing things. I have, I have my own thoughts about whether or not they should be playing at all, but I keep seeing like, Oh, well it was fun while it lasted. And I want, I wonder what it would take to actually shut it down and the fact that whole teams might be shut down for more than one week luckily so so far anyway it's only been a week where a team is shut down they yeah. reschedule some games are you know retooled other ones you know are postponed to a later date i wonder when that starts to add up to more than one week because they don't have enough players you know right. H, hl squads or you know they don't, it's not like they have all these guys where they can bring them up throughout all the ranks um, all these other leagues are doing their own thing too. Uh, and it's going to be hard to get across state lines or whatever the case is. Yeah. So absolutely. It is not getting any easier despite having go living through it. Um, it is not a bubble obviously. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm, I'll wait and see, but yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm starting to really, really doubt that it'll finish, but we'll have to see. We'll see what happens. But speaking of having a hard time, the officials are actually having a hard time or were having a hard time uh, out in Columbus. Uh, when Columbus and Carolina had a game a couple nights ago, there was a, a controversy there. You want to tell us a little bit about what happened, John? So there there was an um, there was an offsides call. And I believe there was a penalty on that because they saw that it wasn't offside. Then it, it came back that um, in fact, it was offside. There was an angle that it, that it was offside by a bit. Not even, not like it was a hair. And they looked at it a second time the next day, and they're like, right. "Okay, that was wrong." Um, supposedly, there's um, an in-house video official that helps relay the information to the refs from Toronto, and the per apparently the person that was doing that video review and sending that information mentioned, "Oh, it's onside." And he sh is not involved in that process. So he he said that the refs heard it. You see them take the headset off, and that they're out of the conversation at that point. They can't be told uh, stop. So then they go and say, "It's a good goal. It was onside." So was it one of those things where he's like kind of just muttering it under his own breath, and they no, heard I it, and they I, they said it was an overzealous guy. I don't I don't know what what the case is. Wow. And then Toronto is just in absolute full Macaulay Coke in disbelief and <laughs> just like, you know, eyes is, you know, deer in the headlights trying to stop this from happening. Yeah. And then eventually it comes back and they, they keep the goal, but they take the rest of the penalty away. Oh, it's so tough, man. So it, that it's is so an tough. absolute disaster. Oh, yeah. Lo line a, um, who was benched recently and we'll talk about that, talk but, about that. yeah. Um, he said after the game that it was an absolute joke. I think I saw oh, yeah. Lino say something really similar. They were pissed. They I don't know. Pissed. I didn't. I didn't like the. Um, I didn't like the explanation. I believe it was from Bill Daly of the NHL. I Who's didn't like, like that explanation. Honestly? Well, no. So what, what his explanation was because the 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 Blue Jackets were like just take the goal away and go back to that time. It's stuff like that's happened where 
the lights go out and they start the second, the third period, but they, at first they play a minute and 20 remaining in the second period. Then they switch sides and go to the third period right. and continue on. Right. Yeah. Ha it's happened before. I've even seen it where that's happened before. Um, I think it even happened at Barclays Center. Like it happened in Probably. an Islander game. Maybe, maybe something like that. I do remember the lights going out for a considerable moment at Barclays Center, whether that's related to this or not. Anyway, he said that there was no precedent for taking the goal away. And that to me isn't a great excuse. I didn't, or explanation rather, that everything's got to start somewhere. And also, this isn't the Supreme Court and we're actually, you know, laws where it actually influences things. Right. Um, this is this is hockey. Just say, yep, we messed up. Easy. This is how we do it. We've done it before. Start the period 120. Right. Blah, blah, blah. Um, there's definitely a precedent for that part of it and starting the period and playing the remaining part. Um, yeah, just take the, especially if this is how it's going to go and we're doing offside review and something like this human error can happen. Yeah, you better start the precedent. Yeah. Because when they lose the game 6 5 by a goal, how do you do that? How do you just let you just gonna let that go yeah, you crazy. think that and then you know what and i then i heard the line a comment and i'm like you know then he's gonna get raked over the coal by the league he's gonna get fined but they actually messed up this time they did. And it was so obvious to the point where they admitted it how i haven't seen that he got fined but the minute i saw that line they clipped i was like this guy's gonna get absolutely smoked well and uh, i'm glad he didn't because he didn't they have to own it he didn't but a game later he got some sort of punishment, and that is that uh, Mr. Tortorella, the head coach of the Columbus Blue Jackets, decided that at six minutes and I believe 12 seconds of the second period, he was going to bench Patrick Laine, and he did not see any more ice after that benching. Uh, and, and crazy enough, fast forward to today, Miko Koivu retires. So now it's just like, okay, what's going on here? Columbus can't retain a superstar. They have they're they're they lose Panarin, they lose Bobrovsky to free agency, they lose Deshane. Uh Pierre Luc Dubois requests a trade at 23 years old, kind of unheard of in the NHL. Uh benches line A, and now Miko Koivu is retiring because he's just kind of like, screw this, I'm out. Is John Tortorella on his way out soon? Is that what it is? Is it John Tortorella? Is it just that Columbus is not a, a a desirable place to be? What is going on in Columbus? I don't the Miko Koivu thing. I don't know that um, that correlation is causation. Like that, all this is going on with Tortorella means that that's why he retired. He may have not wanted to deal with it. But this this smells a lot like Brett Hall playing for the Coyotes for like thirteen games. And then being like, no, nah, I'm done. You know, like it could just be like it's been Maybe. on his mind and all this. The COVID stuff is really tough on him. Maybe the the maybe the locker room is a little dis discombobulated. Maybe the coach isn't helping that. Um, That's maybe right. the vibe of the team. You know, you got to think he was in Minnesota for a real long time. I forget where he was before that, uh, if anywhere. And he may have just been like, nah, I should have just not started the season and all this is a little too much um i'm not playing my best uh, whatever whatever he wants to say he's well within his right i don't know that those two it may be a part of it but i wouldn't be like okay Tor torts needs to leave because miko koivu retired uh, and they think that it's because of him i, I honestly no, no. like i said i think it's more of that you know Brett Hall or some of these guys that play like the one last season. I think Could be. Chris Chelios did that in Atlanta, and he was like, "No, no, we're not gonna. I'm not gonna do this." So um, it, it could be, but you know, after everything that's gone down there, at, at some point, I I gotta feel. I gotta. You gotta figure. Miko Koivu was watching all this go on transpire in front of him and be like, "What is going on here? This is not what happened in Minnesota. I'm out." Yeah, maybe. And Minnesota had its own problems, so maybe if he got to Columbus, he's like, "I'm not dealing with this again." I, you know, I kind of thought this team was on the up and up. Um, yeah, he only played for Minnesota. Right. He played all of seven games for Columbus, so a thousand and twenty-one games in Minnesota. I mean, yeah. and he was, and he was just, you know, as consistent as they come. You know, outside of the last maybe two seasons, 
Um, he always he scored always more than ten goals. He's well above forty points in almost every season, except for the shortened two thousand twelve thirteen season. So, I, I he may have just had enough. I, the COVID thing would might be enough for a lot of players. Sure, if you're at that age. You just yeah. no, um, it's not worth the risk to me and my family. I'm thinking about retiring anyway. You know, I kind of had one foot out of my skate, so to speak, um, or hung up or whatever metaphor you want to use. He may have just been done and be like this atmosphere and this environment and this team coupled with COVID and everything else. Maybe he's probably away from his family Could now be. that I'm thinking about it because they're probably in Minnesota. Um, so that that's enough. If you don't want to be away from your family or whatever the case, I, yeah, I, I totally get it. Yeah. Yeah. I guess we'll see what happens uh, in, in Columbus though, because if you had to guess is torch on his way out, what happens first? They, they I don't know. They, they move another player or, or, or they fire Tortorella. I mean, I think, you know, th- um, real like zooming out a little bit. Um, Vigneault did that to, to connect me ag- against the Islanders. You know, I'm just I'm just saying, like, you take some of it with a grain of salt. Like, okay, that's a tactic coach use that coaches use. Um, the fact that he did it twice to two different players, um, that are did it to Pierre Luc Dubois. Yeah, it's uh, you know, and then I I argue that was a terrible shift, and he was. I've seen beer league shifts better than that. So I, I, yeah, and so I don't. Again, that's. Was he within his right to do that? I don't know. I'd say yes. I didn't. I don't know what happened with Line A necessarily. It sounds like he's been doing really well with Columbus so far. So yeah, he's he's racked up a couple points. So I think he had a two goal game recently. Um, he's he's played really well since. Yeah, four four goals. Wait, four games played, three goals. Yeah, that sounds about right. I, I mean, get granted he had a two goal game, so there was a game where he didn't have any goals. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's, the, it's one of the rare tactics that they have, right. As a coach, yeah. um, I don't know what kind of head games. This sounds maybe like a little Mike Babcock type stuff. Um, it's an old school thing. Um, you know, you, you see that and you wonder, you know, a lot of other teams use it somewhat sparingly. Um, I don't know. I don't, I, He's done the 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 Blue Jackets have done pretty well under Tortorella. They have, yeah. So it's hard to argue with the success. Um, and then you get a guy like Roslovic who had an absolute beauty of a goal the other night. That was unbelievable. I'm not sure how you um, how you you know you argue with that. I mean they're they're second in the division behind Tampa Bay, which isn't really a surprise. They're six five and three. They've also played significantly more games. Than Florida, who's only played nine. Columbus has played fourteen. Carolina's played yeah. ten. So they're only one point above Florida with five more games played, and they're two points behind Tampa with four more games played. So I mean, I guess they're doing okay, but you know, other teams are going to have an opportunity to kind of jump up in there. Florida is somehow six one and two. Jeez. Yeah, they're playing well. Um, so that's that's a surprise. Um, you know, I think. I think a lot of these divisions look like how we thought in the beginning of the season they would look. Um, some surprises, um, but yeah, Columbus is—they're doing okay. I think they need to kind of put it together, and um, hopefully, it wasn't a power move by Trot uh, by uh, Tortorella on Line A um, to, to just kind of put him in his place and show him who's who. dominance. <laughs> yeah, which which seems like such a hockey thing to do. Yeah, and ridiculous at that, right? Um, especially in 2021. But who knows? I honestly I have no idea. Um, I try to keep up with Michael Russo. Uh, well, not Michael Russo. There's another guy, uh, Portsline, I believe, and he's or something like that. Yeah, Adrian Portsline and yeah, Columbus. Aaron, whatever his name is. He's he's really good. So yeah. I I try I do keep up with him. Um, he was he was on STP not too long ago, and they were discussing the trade. And this was kind of before all this happened. So, um, yeah, you hope that Trotz can just get the most out of Line. You want to see him score a bunch of goals, especially if it's not against the Islanders and in the division. So, um, let's enjoy that while it exists, because Line will be back hopefully in in the Metro Division and well, everything back to normal next year. 
Um, yeah, really not excited about line A on top of Crosby no. and Ovechkin. Yeah, we didn't need that. And and Drew and Vord. Yeah, I, nope. And Stan. Uh, but it's like an even swap, right? It's like we get uh, we 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 get line A back, but we give uh, Taylor Hall and Jack Eichel. So I'm okay with that. And then we get uh, Sebastian Aho and, and Andre Shvechnikov, but we we trade. Uh, oh, who's who's that other team? Oh, right, David Parsnock and and Brad Marchand. So it's oh, right. like, yeah, no, you, there's <laughs> the division. The, the Metro is whether without Boston or Buffalo, or it was still really good. So then yeah. you add back in Columbus and and get you know rearrange some things. Um, you know it it doesn't take you know it takes. Pittsburgh making one really nice trade and getting right. a guy like Russell. They always find a way, even though it's not Rutherford anymore. They always find a way. I'm sure Burke and Hexall will figure it out. Hexall's right. fingerprints are all over Philly, who's really good. Um, so it takes like a Roslovic throw in pick kind of guy or whatever kind of thing to just blow up for your team. And yeah, uh, you that I division loved, just got really tough. I loved all the people after that Roslovic goal. That was a beauty. I loved all the people that were tweeting like, wait, imagine Patrick Line being the, th- the throw in to the Roslevic trade. <laughs> I was like, yeah, okay. well, and, they, and then they're both playing well. They're both scoring goals. Yeah. So that that um, Kaki, what is it? Kaki Nemi looks like now that's the player. Um, I can't remember. Fin- another Finnish guy, whoever the Blue Jackets guy is. It looks like a genius. It looks like he did such a good job. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Yarmo Kekalainen. Yep. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I'm getting my my finished names all the Emmy is the center on the Montreal Canadians. <laughs> right, right, right. I got a little excited. Yeah. Messed, a lot got, of consonants got, there. Yeah. Jeez. Just a lot of hard <laughs> K sounds. I can't differentiate between anything. I can barely speak English. What does Bruce Willis say? I speak two languages, English yeah. and bad English. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I was on the bad English side of all of that. I speak even worse Italian. If you can believe it. No, come on. Yeah. No, I was, that's a mess. That's okay. Well, speaking of your English, let's see if you can nail this ad read, huh? Yeah. So uh, really excited about this um, Long Island hockey. So we're going to bring um, on the island brought to you by the Long Island Hockey Company. Um, the Long Island Hockey Company is a local hockey clothing brand with a goal to unite all hockey fans from Mites to Beer League, from Isle fan, Isles fans to Ranger fans. Uh, what started as a passion project in 2015 from their parent company, Amity Harbor Sports, another a great supporter of the show. Long Island Hockey Company has quickly grown into a lifestyle brand with owners who are dedicated to supporting their local community as much as possible. Uh, recently, Mike and Rachel Bennett were featured in U.S. Hockey Magazine as the New York Islanders Community Heroes of the Week for the work they did using their platform to fight uh, to fight food, food insecurity with a hat fundraiser that helped donate 4,000 meals to local Long Island food banks. Um, they've been a great partner to us. Uh, James is wearing... His Long Island hockey shirt um, with uh, paying homage to the LA Kings. Um, super they're... cool, super comfortable, great fit. Love the shirt. Yeah, and he has a cool hat. My my stuff's on the way. I'm really excited. Um, so you can check out. Yeah, the hat is. Uh, they have they have some cool colors. Um, a lot of great merch. Um, it was really hard to decide uh, what, what to grab from there. And you can check out their full clothing line for fans of all ages at Long Island Hockey Company. Long Island Hockey Co.com and on Instagram at Long Island Hockey Co. Definitely check them out. I love that they're, um, they keep it really simple while making it like unique. Uh, yeah. and, and they, and they stand out from some other things. Um, there are a lot of great brands, but I, I particularly like their stuff and they incorporate, um, the vintage NHL logos. Yeah. Um, the, the hoodies are dope. I, I, I everything from there is great. So, Definitely check that out, and uh, thank you to Long Island Hockey and Avenue Harbor Sports. Yeah, absolutely. I would have been wearing my beanie right now. I just did not feel like sweating this entire broadcast. That would have been, it would have stunk. So I'm going to save that for the outdoors. Is that yeah, that save it. So down there, you know what's really funny? Um, before we get to Islanders news, so I move up. I'm, I've been living in Syracuse for some time, Central New York, and going to college up in the area, and I've played. Almost zero pond hockey up here because it's snow- because it because it snows too much and everything gets covered in snow immediately. Come on, grab a shovel. Don't be lazy. Um, I, look, I've tried. I've we tried. <laughs> I sent you those pictures. My my brother right. got like this pump. We're like cutting holes in the ice, and it was a disaster. And then I see pictures of Long Island Hockey Company with with Blue Point beers and all sorts of Montauk Brew and their cool Carhartt bags. 
and all this stuff and you know sharing it on our instagram and i'm just sitting there like I, <laughs> because i didn't want to play and i'm jealous yeah. i've actually i've the the pond hockey that i have played like with other people was on uh gibbs pond road actually in rock uh in lake grove that's like one of the only times i've, I've actually skated and it wasn't even up here where it's cold most yeah. of the time um so yeah, I'm a little aggravated that you guys have some access to things that's cold. Although you get slammed with bigger snowstorms, but we get yeah. snow. We get like three inches every day from January to Mother's Day. So uh, it's a little different. Yeah, it snows until like the second weekend, the first or second right. weekend in May. It's nuts. Um, lake is completely frozen, but there's also six inches of snow on it, and it's mush. Yeah. So yeah. Anyway, Islanders news. Yeah, so let's talk about points in four straight games, two straight wins. Um, before jumping into the games themselves, though, let's start with some questions. Are the Islanders back, right? We just had that five-game losing streak. All on the road, by the way. Good tweet today by you. No losses at home. Um, but now back-to-back -back games, they, they've they won. Uh, it's kind of sort of looks like they're getting back you know, back to their 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 game that they play, the Barrage Hut system. Is it legit? I've been thinking about this. So we wrote this question whenever I wrote this question. And I've been thinking about it. I'm thinking about our boy Bjorn, who listens to the show from somewhere in Scandinavia. <laughs> uh, which is oh, Bjorn. Oh, it's so fun, which is amazing. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, dude. Thanks, dude. Um, I we love the emails. He supports the show. It's it's awesome. But um you know, thinking about, you know, wants us to stay positive. And I, I've thought about this team right now in from two perspectives. Um, they're, they have points in four straight. They're above NHL 500. Sorokin's kind of figuring himself out. Barzell's playing out of his mind. Um, you know, Noah Dobson really looking good. Um, defense is, is kind of coming revitalized Jordan Eberle. He's looking a lot better as well. That's a good point. Um, like I was saying, Dobson looks great next to green. They're really kind of uh, finding that chemistry. Um, they're eliminating mistakes as you go on. And a lot to look, you know, we did that poll the other day um, after the Islanders won against Pittsburgh. And a lot of people were, you know, they had their fingers crossed or they thought the team was trending upward. A majority of over 100 votes thought that. And I thought that was like 80% thought that. And I was like, okay, that's pretty good. You know, that's, you know, there's optimism, which is a weird thing for Islander fans, especially <laughs> on Twitter, um, myself included, you know, but, but then I, then I think about this team and, and some of the struggles that are going on. And I don't know, I honestly don't love, you know, they scored two goal, two quick goals. I don't know. That game wasn't great for me yesterday. I, I'm seeing a lot of mistakes still against Pittsburgh. You know they they get that one that the the game winning goal and it's it's a little dirty and it's you know on on the power play I believe, um, a Anders Lee, I don't know, um, those games against Philly were really not great. So looking at that four game the last four games and collecting points, okay, that's really good, um, but they've also lost uh, six games, including the two overtime losses so far. Yeah, and and they're they're super inconsistent. Um, Nelson is a ghost. Bailey looks terrible, rather not terrible, invisible. Like, don't notice him out there at all. Rare, slight little glimpses of him making a nice pass, which he's known for. Um, but I, he is just absolutely invisible. Um, Nelson is, you know, there he's making mistakes. At least his name's being mentioned in the broadcast a little bit, even if you're rolling your eyes after Brennan Burke says, and Nelson crosses the blue line, um, and loses the puck. So I, I think I'm confused. I don't know what this team is right now <laughs> because you can, like I said, you can look at this team. You can write two very different articles about where they are. Yeah. They're trending up and, and all this kind of stuff. Varlamov, a huge bright spot. He is he is the only uh, other, maybe other than Barzell, who took a, loads of penalties recently, although he's calmed down quite a bit. Um, maybe he's putting time out. But Varlamov is the really the only Islander that looks has been pretty flawless. 
and he's only getting better the more starts and and yeah. some time off and different here and there. He's really the only player that I, I'm not worried about whatsoever. So it's interesting, right? Because you know, Trotz did admit not I think two games ago, right before the Penguins game, that he's still trying to figure out what his lines are. So he's doing some shuffling still. Kiefer Bellis is drawn in in two games. Wallstrom looks really good right now. He he had like five shots on goal last night or two nights ago um, as you're listening to this. But, you know, Bailey's up on the top line. And like you said, yeah, he doesn't he doesn't look too great. Uh, Anders Lee, for some reason or another, can't figure out how to finish. You know, besides that game winner against the Penguins, he, he constantly is – just losing that puck, right? He wins the puck battles. This is what I was saying to, I think we were talking about this off air. He wins his puck battles, right? He he gets, he gains the position and he has possession of that puck, but then for some reason or another, it just trickles away from him and he doesn't get it or the shot goes wide. So Lee's having a hard time just finishing. I mean, he's got four goals in 11 games. He does, and that's good, but he could have, legitimately, he could have 10 goals in 11 games. So that's that's the thing, you know, that would that would really bring that Islanders 2.3 goals per game up immensely if he could just figure out that one little a- aspect of his game. But, you know, I mean, they're generating that line at least is generating something. Oh, yeah, There's, absolutely. So, I mean, you shared today that uh, again, the positive is that Barzell is rolling. The negative sure. is that just like Edmonton, where without dry and McDavid, the offense is absolute hot garbage. Right. The There's Islanders, no... the Islanders, you know, forty eight percent of the goals scored, uh, Barzell has a, a hand in 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 some way. And last night was a good, it was a positive uh, moment for the team having those two goals scored by the fourth line. Oh yeah, very big moment. to to have your bottom six chip in. Um, really get those. You know, Sezikis is capable. And if hopefully that wakes them up and the identity That's, line, right, um, right. Uh, which definitely go pick up that beer from uh, Oyster Bay Brewing Company. Great collaboration there at the end of yeah, the line. Cool. Looks, looks good. I got to go pick it up next time I'm allowed to travel that far. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I think um, I, I think there's that's a good sign, but that the third line is still what is that? But Billy is going to come back eventually. Does that mean Komarov is finally out? Does that That's mean the hope, right? Wallstrom is going to, you know, Zarnak looked really good. I've liked Wallstrom, but I liked Bellows more. So I'm, I'm confused at where the I lineup's going and Trotz wants to solidify things. That's kind of where, and think the shuffling is slowed down a little bit, but this is where musical chairs stopped. With granted, it's without Bavillier. That's fine. Really, this is where the music stopped on these guys. We know that there are better players. I understand they're winning hockey games. It was not pretty against the Rangers. I said that to you and Joe in our chat. I almost fell asleep. It was very. It, it it was not for low, the start. It was low event hockey. Well. It was a wide open game. There was a lot of back and forth play. Yeah, but and it was a lot. Yes and no. I mean the the uh, in the first period it was the Islanders had one high danger chance, like, uh, four, and that was the only high danger chance in the period. Yeah, the, it was. Yeah, it was a little back and forth, some odd man rushes, but um, the Rangers seemed to get the better of them, and they botched them pretty good. Panarin had a breakaway. Zabanjad had a couple of shots. Um, Varlamov looked pretty comfortable out there stopping them all. So I, I, I don't want to rely on it. I mean, he's there to uh, mitigate the mistakes, and then he can't make any. He's said as much in some interviews. Yeah. Um, and Trot said, you know, that he's mentioned that as well. That he, you know, when the team makes mistakes, that's what he's there for, and he's largely done that. Yeah. Um, but I, but I think, um, there, there's still it was still a sleepy game. It, the, the energy just wasn't there consistently well the the question here was you know are the islanders back and and i think the answer really is it still still remains to be seen we need a couple more games to really find out right because they're still shuffling the lines and we're going to talk a little bit about that too um 
it, it's slowing down, but you know, we, we don't know exactly who's going to be in and out every, every single night. Um, the fourth line woke up seemingly last night. If they can continue and, and keep going, that identity line is, it, it, you know, they're, they're the engine. If they can c- keep up that consistent consistency, keep up that play. Sure. They're back. But it, it all comes down to the line shuffling. And it slowed down. Um, the secondary scoring has picked up mainly because a piece of that first line is now on the second line. And Jordan Eberle is playing with Brock Nelson. Um, and whoever decides to be on the left wing at that point. who It's been Michael Dalcol recently. And he's been trending up. And we're going to talk about that too. Um, but the, the big, big thing here is Peugeot's line mates, right? I've been saying this forever i think we might have even said it last week with joe on the show i really 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 think that anders lee would really benefit from third line minutes at this point you're you're starting to see and and i know it's only been a few games for wallstrom he had five shots last night the confidence is growing he has a really good shot He needs to be put in a position because right now he's working third line minutes in in almost a checking role. He needs to be put in a position where he can utilize his talents. He is a shooter. Shooters need to shoot. Isn't Pajot, doesn't he have that ability? Isn't it more of. But the line isn't being utilized for that purpose right now. So here's what I think is going to happen. That's what I mean. Is it a deployment issue or is it a line mate issue? Wouldn't it be just as easy to say, you know, for trust to to get them to play more of an offensive game versus I understand what you're Maybe. saying. And we've talked about this where, you know, bringing Lee down and, sh- and giving Wallstrom or Bellows first line minutes. I, I I'm, I'm here for that. Honestly. Yeah. Um, I don't know that. I don't know where Bailey fits into that because I think, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. Do you put Bavillier up with, up with Barzell? They have played well together. That may be what Trot's thinking. Maybe but you, you put Bailey down on that third line. That would with, work as well with Wallstrom and Pajot. And that you put Bavillier well. in the first line, and you you know Komarov is an odd man out. Hopefully, Wallstrom st- or Dal Cole right. or somebody Bellows sticks around. So um, that that could very well be it, and it could work out too because Bavillier is a left hand shot, right? So he could get that shot off on the right side, playing the right wing. Yeah, it 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 could work. It, I think they like to have a. So, you know, uh, to at least two of the same handedness on the line, although the, that's the second line, line was all, it is a it is it is a fast line. I think, I think Barzell just needs some players he can depend on, and for a long time it was Lee and Eberle, and that might just need a shake up. He may just need to go yeah. back playing with Bavillier, and the more that I think about it, that hopefully Bavillier is back pretty quickly. Uh, you know, he's he was unavailable for the Ranger game. Hopefully, he's available for Pittsburgh. We haven't heard anything yet. I suspect we won't until game day, um, as that's just how they release uh, who's playing that day. Um, but that makes a lot of sense. And they may have just lost their chemistry a little bit. Everly's kind of doing the work himself on that second line. It's not he, a whole. He he's is. not. He's not getting a whole lot of help. Um, but that's it's revived him a little bit. And maybe. And I was thinking about this during the game on the last couple games maybe he's kind of feeling the pressure in a good way. He's like, I have to be the guy. There's no Barzell on this line. I have to be the one that that stirs the drink. I have to be what does this and, and is the engine on this line to get things going in the offensive zone, especially in tight, which he, he plays super well. Yeah. Um, you know, it gets those shots off with, you know, between the, the edge of the circle and, and the net. Um, I don't know how he gets those, those short angle shots. And the, the, the bad thing is when he misses the net, he misses it hard, but yeah. But I mean, you're you're right though. Maybe he is the guy who needs to be making things happen out there, and he certainly is. Don't get you know, don't get it twisted. He's got five goals in, in or is it six now? Six in his first eleven. Did he score last game? No, it was two by the fourth line. So he's got five in his first eleven. It took him fourteen games last season to get his first. So he's definitely got it going right now. Um, Brock Nelson. You know, we said he he he's not. I think he was a little better in that Ranger game. I think he's starting to to find his way back. But um, you know, that that second line was what got the Islanders where they were in the bubble. This year, you don't see that same you know kind of production. Given you know 
Bovillier is out right now. But I mean, you're seeing again, you're seeing Barzell really and yeah. Lee and Everly being the only people producing outside of the, the fourth line, the last game. Right. You're you're not. It's the entire rest of the lineup. The the D um, started to contribute a little bit. They're you know getting getting shots through at least, and they were picking up some goals, so that was a good sign. Um, but they're not really producing either. So it's it's really thinly spread out yeah. between three lines and defense. When, yeah, so I think the line shuffling is, is it's slowing down, and, and I think it's it's going to stick as soon as Bovillier is back, right? So Bovillier is back. Where does he, you know, where does he land? You said first line with Barzell and who? I th- I think Lee, Lee Barzell Bavillier, um, is Walsh from uh, Dal Cole's on that second line, right? Dal Cole is on the second line, and we're going to talk about him because I think he should stick. Right. So yeah, Dal Dal Cole Nelson and Bailey on sure. on that second line. No, and or um. You know, I, I'd like to see Bailey, Pajot, and uh, no. Pelos Rewind. on the third line. Rewind. You forgot Jordan Eberle. Jordan, all right, so Jordan Eberle on the second line with Nelson right. and Dal Cole. Yes. And then Bailey, Pajot, Bellows, or Wallstrom. Yeah. This, Whatever. See, this is where it gets And tough that's a because... good problem. You, 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 yes. can interchange those, you can interchange those guys. I'm not worried about that. But they both... I... My thing is, I think they both need consistent minutes. And now that Michael Dalcol is in favor because he's playing so well, it, it creates an issue. I mean, I, I think it's the three of them. Two of them are going to be in the lineup, and one isn't. If I had my druthers, right. so it's either Dalcol on the second line, or Bellows on the second line, or Wallstrom on the third. Or you know, you can you can kind of move those guys and yeah. not. You know, I think Dalcol should be the one probably. St- playing more consistently if he's playing well if he's not obviously take him out um, sure well, you know but we've seen that with Komarov too and that doesn't matter and right uh, god I, I don't know how to describe that situation anymore but um because he's really looked absolutely terrible outside of one shift a game um and then he immediately does something to, every time he's on the ice i'm like he's just gonna swing his stick and get a penalty like he's every time he's gonna elbow someone in the head some something dumb yeah um anyway um, yeah, I'd like to see the three of them kind of interchange on that second and third line with Bailey and Peugeot or or Eberle and and Nelson. Um, depending on you know with with Eberle on the on the second line with Nelson, that's a huge scoring threat. So maybe you need a guy like Dal Cole to really stir it up. You need a, you need that lines essentially that lines um, Anders Lee. You know who's yeah. the body who's going to get the puck in deep, do the smart thing, get in front. Uh, cause havoc. He's, he's played really well. You might yeah. as well talk about it. Um, he's been a surprise the last couple of games. He's made some really good plays and some passes. It looks like he's gaining confidence with the puck. It doesn't look like he thinks it's a hand grenade at the end of his stick anymore. Right. And I, I think it's, I think it's really good for this team to have that. He needs to produce. Obviously, I think you want to see the point totals um, start adding up a little bit. But it's good to see, and it's you know that kind of uh, comp- internal competition. He kind of ups his stock a little bit. I think it was pretty high with trots to begin with. Yeah. Um, and then you all, you know, and then you also have Zarnik who surprised. So you, yeah, you kind of have four guys that you feel pretty comfortable. Granted, everyone's, com- uh, everyone's healthy. Um, I'd love to see Bailey, Bailey or Lee on the third line. However, you want to mix that up um, with Pajot and, and one of the kids. Yeah, it would make sense. Um, you know, I, I think that if Bailey was on the third line, he's the passer for a Wallstrom or a Bellows, who are the shooters. And 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 you have Peugeot. You know, he plays a he plays a, a a hard game. He could be the guy in front of the net and and you know, clean it up the dirty go, uh, the dirty rebounds and everything. So or he's, I can he's see that working havoc. out. You know, he's, yeah, dump, right. he's dumping the puck. He's retrieving it. He's, yeah. he's really fast. So that that there's something there where I, I I'm interested to see how things shake up when. When Bavillier comes back, I think Trotz is trying to set it up to insert him somewhere. Yeah, um, I think Bavillier has killed penalties before, so if that if if I'm right in that, that makes it easier for Komarov to come out. If I'm not mistaken, yeah, I think that's what... Bailey. It was either Bailey and Nelson or Bavillier Nelson, or maybe all three have. have I think you're right. I think it was all three. 
So without Com, you know, if Bivile does come back and Komarov comes in, um, they can either put him on waivers. He's exempt for a little while longer, or it just expired because he went through waivers once with the taxi squad. So they could send him down um, to the taxi squad again. So we'll we'll see what happens. But I suspect this is a setup for um, when Bavillier comes back. Either a very slight yeah, switch of Bailey and Bavillier, or leaving Bailey with Lee and Barzell and just sticking Bavillier on the third line with yeah, um, or switching with Dal Cole. So I I think there's only you know got, there's only a, there's obviously it's only four three lines from the work with, but um, I think it's going to be between Bailey, Dal Cole, and Bavillier. The three of them would be switching around. At yeah. least two of them switch. Well, let's talk about that call real quick. Uh, this will be probably the last thing we talk about for today. But, man, I, I got to say, I, I'm impressed with what I've seen. And a lot of people hate on Dal Cole. And, you know, he stinks. He's not a fifth round or, I'm sorry, fifth overall pick. This, that, and the other thing. He's looked real good in, in every single chance he's had this season. He had that two-point, his first two-point game uh, against Pittsburgh. Uh, a couple of great feeds, uh, good setups, and, and you know, I, I'm of the mindset where he's still young enough that maybe he'll figure it out. Maybe he won't. But what he's doing right now, if he can keep that consistent, you know, every night, that's fine too. I just yeah. think that he's 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 doing all the little things right, and if he can contribute. A couple of points here and there, that's perfect. I think it's just even if he's not scoring, I think he just looks better out there. He's at least making yeah. some plays. They're generating some stuff. He's he's never really been a liability in the defensive zone, and that's no. probably what kept 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 him in the lineup uh, at any point, or or put him in the lineup at any point. Um, he has two points in four games this year. Um, you know, last last season he had ten points in fifty three games. So he's, you know, he's on pace to to do a little bit better. Now that he's getting minutes, and um, maybe this he's is the best better line mates. Yeah, we've said that too with a lot of different players. Um, you know, with with Bellows too. I wrote that article for the hockey writer hockey writers not too long ago, um, where you know, playing with a even a Peugeot or a Nelson or whatever, um, you don't want to give him the need a rider treatment. Or the Dow Cole treatment for a long time, where they were on these lower lines and in checking roles, and you, you kind of stunt the growth a little bit. Bailey maybe in that position too, although I, that might, there's a whole lot of there's a longer story there. Um, starting at 18 years old on a on a so so team, I don't know that he should be put in that position, but you can read up on that in the archives somewhere. Um, on just search Google, I'm sure you can find the story, but. I'm happy that he's playing on that line and been given that opportunity. He obviously has a trust of trots. Yeah. So it's nice to see that. And then it's really great to see him actually utilize and, and just play well in general. Yeah, definitely. I, I think that he's deserved uh, or he's earned the chance to stick where he is right now. Um, I'd like to, you know, I, if he gets to, if he gets the opportunity to, to, to score a goal in it and he puts one in the back of the net, I'm going to be stoked to see that. I, I hope that that happens for him. Um, maybe it'll help open the floodgates. He looks faster. He looks confident. He's he's forechecking really well. He's back checking really well. Um, he's a good addition to that line right now. If that changes, so be it because of you know change in play. But as of right now, nobody can say anything bad about Michael Dow Cole. He's doing well with the opportunity he's being given. We'll see if it sticks. But uh, Isles are up uh, tomorrow or tonight as you're listening to this against Pittsburgh, 7 p.m. Uh, thank you to everyone who's listening to the show. Please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen or watch the show as well. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Nassim and Hockey and find our work at The Hockey Writers. Our new uh, name tags or, or Twitter handles are now uh, shown on the screen, but you can follow us on Twitter as well. Um a huge thank you to our new partners at the Hockey Podcast Network and our supports at Amity Harbor Sports and the Long Island Hockey Company. Um, you can also check out our Patreon to support the show and get access to our weekly newsletter, additional articles, uh, and bonus episodes that we put out uh, on a weekly basis. But until next time, everybody, let's go Islanders.